That's what we need, Lord. softly in the background.
2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8 says, And God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come in abundance to you, so that you may always under all circumstances, regardless of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything. Being completely self-sufficient in him and have an abundance for every good work and act of charity. As it is written and forever remains written, he the benevolent and generous person scattered abroad, he gave to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who provides, verse 10, seed for the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your seed for sowing. That is your resources. And increase the harvest of your righteousness which shows itself in active uh, shows itself in active goodness kindness and love you will be enriched in every way so that you may be generous and this generosity administered through um, us is producing thanksgiving to God from those who benefit this is a sermon in and of itself but this is only for giving and this is uh, I believe in the month of August by God's grace we're going to be looking at the topic of money and giving and God's expectation for the believer but today I want to challenge you with this scripture this is 2 Corinthians chapter 9 from 8 to 11 and there's so much in there but the long and short I want to submit to you for offering today is that God gives seed to the sower. God gives seed to the sower so that you can reap a harvest. So if God gives you the seed, you can expect a harvest. And whilst God was expecting or God is expecting a harvest, I would have expected an amen. If God gives you a seed, you should be expecting a harvest. Very well. Can't compel you. This is the scripture. This is the word of God. And if you truly want to cling on to it, you will see the fruit of this. God gives seed to the soul doesn't just say you would reap but it talks about how you would reap bountifully you reap bountifully because it's not your seed it's God's seed and anything that God designs or creates has the ability to create more has the ability to multiply has the ability to go over and beyond and so today as we give bear this in mind let this word today be a seed for you Lord, I'm trusting you for more. Lord, I've, I've got something, but I'm trusting you for more. Well, what you've got is a seed. And the seed is good enough to multiply. Moses had one rod. What that rod was able to do was well beyond what we can understand a stick can do. But God placed something in his hands. And if God has placed something in your hands today, and I submit once again that it has the ability to multiply. If God has provided work for you, that is a source of income. Even with that, you have the ability to multiply. This week on the news, there's just been bad news after bad news after bad news. But the Lord has the ability to cause you to multiply in times like this. If you would hold on to his word. So as we give, I believe the card reader is at the back. Just quickly checking to see if the link is in the WhatsApp group. If the link isn't there, ladies, please, could somebody put it in there? The link in the WhatsApp group. For those of you who have the church bank account details, you can do it there. If you have cash, you can do it at the back. Now, 
now he who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your seed. That is your resources. <laughs> wow. It's not just your money as well, guys. What is in your hand? What are the resources that God has placed within you? God wants to multiply that. Bring that. Bring that to the table. Bring that to the altar. Let God multiply your seed. So for everyone that has used their phone to pay or whatever mechanism you've used to, to give today or to sow today, I want you to lift it. I'm going to pray. If it's your phone, lift your phone. If it's your card, lift your card. If you weren't able to today because you don't have, lift your phone anyway. If you don't have a phone, lift your wallet, wherever it is, lift it. Lord, today, as we lift our means of giving before you, we commit the seed that we have laid before you into your hands. And as it is sown in fertile ground, I'm praying that you would cause this seed to grow and to multiply 30, 60, 100 fold. That you would cause them to prosper. That you would cause not just their finances to prosper, but all the resources that you have given them as a means to prosper in this lifetime. Would you breathe on it? Would you cause life to flow from it again? In the name of Jesus Christ. We come against poverty. We come against restriction when it comes to finances. We come against restrictions when it comes to the area of living in freedom. We come against the devourers that would come and try and sap people's resources and sap people's incomes. We come against the power of debt. Let there be debt cancellations in this house in the name of Jesus Christ. Where people have suffered lack, we command that lack they will suffer from no more in the name of Jesus. But they will abound, they will overflow. They will walk in the overflow. They will be means, they will be a means of blessing to those that are around them. They will be a means of blessing to communities. They will be a means of blessings to nations and governments in the name of Jesus. They will be a means of blessing to the body of Christ. They will be a means of blessing to the local house in the name of Jesus. No more lack. Let everyone say, no more lack. No more lack. No more lack in my finances. As it has been said, Lord, be it unto them according to their faith. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed, amen. Amen and amen. Before we go, just greet somebody today. Say hi to somebody greet them, say hello, say you're looking well, wonderful, um, today we are, we have our social and, you know, we have our media day as well. So I don't want to take too much of our time. But I want us to um, go back to Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 1. Thank you. Um, last week we looked at men and well, we actually, we didn't. That's what we're going to look at today. But last week we looked at... Amen. Thank you. Maybe I will... I'll put you on the rotor for next month. 
We spoke about faith, the reality. Faith has a reality and we also looked at the fact that not only does faith has, have a reality, fear has a reality. Fear presents reality as well. A reality, should I say. But I, I want to go on to say that faith doesn't just present a reality, it presents, presents realities. There are realities. There's a reality in the area of your health. There's a reality in the area of your finances. There's a reality in the area of relationships. There's a reality in the area of your career. There's a reality in the area of, of community. There's a reality in the area of your future. There's a reality in the area of your spiritual walk. So it's not just one reality. There are many realities. And so your life, your faith life is a culmination. It's a summation of these realities coming together. Your imagination presents realities. I think I said it last year. That you should pray over your imagination because your imagination gives you, gives you the ability to believe for things and in things that even though you might not see it in your human reality, it's still a possibility in God's world. Unbelievers have been able to master this and they have an unsanctified imagination. And yet they can believe to do the wildest things. We saw this week how, I can't remember the number of men, but a group of men that went into the, into the submarine to go and, and, and see the Titanic, Titanic, they perished this week because of vain imaginations. Someone say vain imaginations. Someone had, someone had an idea or some people had an idea that we can go using this mechanism, using this submarine or this, you know, this, this small version of a submarine and we can go down and, 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 and we can go and see the Titanic. We can go beyond what man has done before or men and women have done before. Let's push the boundary or the boundaries. They broke rules. They broke protocol. They didn't listen. They didn't seek advice and they went off on their way. Those that joined them to a degree understood that there was a level of risk. But I was saying to PT this week that the level of risk that they took, part of it, because people are, you know, people are like, why did they do it? Why did they do it? Why did they do it? It's part of human nature in some way, shape or form to take risk. Some of you are like, oh, we're risk averse. When you were living sinful lives, you took risk on the sins that you were committing. Amen. Don't get quiet on me. I'm just starting my sermon. When you were living in your wicked ways, when you were living in your sinful ways, you took risk on sin. Oh, I don't take risk on trade. I don't really do trading. I don't really do investment. But you took investment on the sins that you were committing. You took the risk. Knowing that what you were doing was wrong, but for a moment of pleasure, you did what you did. And so, for these men, they knew that there was a level of risk in what they, do, in what they were doing, but there was, there was a part of the imagination that said, if we're successful, we will be remembered. No? Everyone was complaining and getting at them and, oh, it was sad. It's, and it's, it's, a very, it's a very terrible thing. But it goes to show you, it goes to show you how far an unredeemed mind would go. In the book of Genesis, it talks about how people came together to build the Tower of Babel. Do we know that story? And they built a tower they built a tower, we need to, we can, we can be like God, we can come together and we can build something that the world would be mesmerized by. And they had a level of faith that they could come together. If enough people could come together and build this vision, the world would look at this and respect them for what they did. Yes? No? So when it comes to the area of faith, what I'm trying to say or to, to start off by saying is that faith presents not just a reality, but a summation of realities. Same with fear. 
Everything that I said for faith, your, your health, your finances, your career, your this, your that. Fear also presents a rea- or realities, a summation of realities for all those things. If it's your finances. The enemy, doesn't, the enemy might want you to prosper, at, but at a cost. There's a price. If the enemy wants you to prosper, it comes at a price. There's always a catch. Somebody say there's always a catch. If it's your health, the enemy doesn't want you to prosper. He may want you to live life. He may want you to to, to live according to the pleasures of the world. And one day, it will have its cost on you. Eat as much as you like. Do what you like. One day, it's going to come and bite you. Career, also the same thing. Many people are making career moves, not out of faith, but out of fear. I don't want to be like mom. I don't want to be like dad. I don't, want, I don't want my ceiling to be capped. So you make decisions in your career based on fear and not on faith. Some of you are saying to yourself, some of you have convinced yourself that it's faith that led you to do what you're doing. Even on a practical level. What some people have called honor has actually been a move of fear. You went to university. You studied a degree that you weren't passionate about. I did it because, oh, hello, don't go quiet on me today. You went to uni to study a degree that you weren't passionate about. I did it for mom. I did it for dad. I did it for this. I did it for that. Fine. You You have to acknowledge you've made your own choice, Abby. Yes? But at the same time, you must recognize that what happens, what the aftermath of that is that the enemy would, you would do your degree, you would move forward, you would do X, Y, and Z, and then you come to a point where you come to a crossroads. What do I want to do next? I don't know. I've just got to do anything but this. You, you, You don't have a clue. You don't have direction. You've just got, well, I've started on this. I've just got to go all the way. And we've deceived ourselves. We said it's career progression. But progression at what cost? Because imagine Simon Peter. Imagine Simon Peter, a fisherman who was doing what he needed to do. And one day, Jesus said, yeah, this is great, fantastic. You're a fisherman, da 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 But I'm going to show you how to become a fisher of men. Simon Peter, the uh, extra biblical writings show us that Simon Peter was, was in a lot of debt. Simon Peter was in a lot of debt. So when he was fishing, he was fishing to pay off this debt to the Roman, Roman consuls or the Roman governors of the time. And for those that, that, that may not know, the context of Jesus' time was that they were under occupation. They were being colonized, right, by the Romans, Yes. So Peter had to pay extra taxes. He not only had to pay tax to to one government, but he also had to pay taxes to another government, right? And so he's he's living life, having always been behind. And Jesus says, look, I'm going to change the narrative, but I will establish it on this thing called faith, on this premise called faith. How? Simon Peter is toiling all night. He, night sorry, he's, he's looking for fish. He's trying to catch some fish, but he hasn't. Jesus is now on, on, on the way to beginning his ministerial, public ministerial journey. He sees Simon Peter and he says to Simon Peter, hey, just push. Can I use your boat? Just push it out. Like, just you know, do your thing. We want to cast your net. Simon Peter said, but we've... we've toiled all night we've been fishing all night that's the right time to catch fish and now you're telling me in the day to go and catch fish yes and as Simon Peter does so we see that as he launches his net in the deep even with that element of reluctance he launches his net into the deep and his biggest ever catch comes off the back of the word of faith so everything I was saying to you before about what fear presents, this, that, and the third, God always has a cycle breaker and it brings us to the point of faith. No matter how far you've gone, 
there's a circuit breaker where God introduces you to the realm of faith that brings you to where you need to be. We see the, 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 the story of the prodigal son. He ran away. He spent all his money. But at the point of him coming back, everything was restored. Maybe that's a word for somebody today. Lord, I've, I've strayed. I've gone too far away. I've, I've, done, I've gone too far out. No, there's nothing too far. The Bible even says what can separate us from the love of God. What you thought, we who were once far off have become nigh because of the blood of Christ. You think you're far, but the blood of Jesus has redeemed you and brought you full circle. So for some of you today, Lord, I, I just feel like it's doubt. I just feel like it's this. That's fine. The Lord is releasing faith in this place today. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. No worries. There's a word, for the, there's a word from the Lord right now that would restore your faith. Let faith be restored in this place today in Jesus' name. And so, going back to Hebrews 11, faith shows us the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things that we cannot see. Last week, I spoke about the word faith in the Hebrew, the word pistis. We spoke about the substance, the foundation, hypostatis, the substructure from which we build our faith upon. There's a structure upon which we build our faith. Amen? So we don't just build it out of speaking it and, and confessing it and, and speaking it out there into the atmosphere. There's a structure upon which we build our faith. And it's the word of God. And it's, it's, it's the word of God. And the Bible says that word became flesh. And that flesh, that, that word that became flesh dwelt amongst us. And even now today, that word that became flesh who ascended now lives on the inside of us. So now the substructure that we're looking outwardly for is the one that is the foundation or the source of our hope. Did you hear what I said? The substructure, the foundation of our faith is no longer out there. We're not, we're not looking for something out there. The foundation is now within. The psalmist called him the rock of my salvation. Jesus, the rock of our the foundation upon we, which we build from. Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus is the foundation from which you build from. So now faith is the substructure from which we hope from. The proof of things not yet seen that have been tried and tested. That's something that I didn't get to speak on much last week. The evidence of things not seen was the second half of Hebrews 11 verse 1. Right? Right? Hello? Do we have our Bibles in front of us? I don't want you to just look at me as well. I want you to write your notes. That's what good Bible students do. So it says, faith shows us the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Have you ever read that scripture and thought, what on earth does this mean? How can there be evidence for something you haven't seen? How can there be evidence for something you haven't seen. If we go, if, if we go to the court of law and, and a judge says to a prosecutor, bring forth your evidence. And, say, and he says, or she says, I have evidence for something that nobody has seen before. The judge would say, this is nonsense. And you cannot use that as evidence because we cannot see it. It's intangible. Somebody say intangible. So the writer of Hebrews says, it's the evidence of something that we have not seen. But what does evidence mean? Evidence is something that's real, that points to a truth or points to a fact. And evidence is tangible. Somebody say tangible. So when someone says Jesus was real, it's not just because we read it in the Bible. There's, actually, there's not just Christian writers. There's actually unbelieving writers that wrote about Jesus Christ. 
There were philosophers that wrote about this man called Jesus Christ. There was evidence. There's written evidence. It's tried and it's tested and it's proven to be true. And remember, evidence works both ways. Hello? I'm sure we've watched some sort of crime film or, or film or film that has a has a has a court scenario in it. Evidence works both ways. It can work for the victim. It can work for the for the person who is accused of a crime. That evidence can be used to vindicate someone who's been accused of a crime. Amen. And so what in this case this narrative of faith even though we can't see it the writer says it can be substantiated. I can't see your imagination. I can't see the God dreams that he's deposited in you, in your head. But in the process of time, when these things come to reality, that's the proof of your faith substantiated. That's the evidence. It was in your head. We said you were mad. We fought. We fought this. We fought this idea that God gave you, Timmy, was crazy. But now we're seeing it. We know that your faith is real. Your faith is substantiated when it's tried and it's tested. When your faith is tried and tested, what it produces is the evidence. It's the evidence. It's the evidence to who? It's the evidence to everybody else. Because the reality is, what God starts inwardly, you know it's a God thing. When God deposits it, when the God deposits his seed inside you, you know it's a real thing. God, this is crazy. This is mad. You tell people, they're like, no, this doesn't make sense. When it comes to reality, to them it makes sense. But to you, it already made sense because God deposited and affirmed that thing inside you. And when it was tried and it was tested, it became a reality. Joseph, the Bible said that he was given dreams and visions. That his brother and his family members would one day bow before him. When he told them, they said he was crazy. That's faith. One day you guys are going to bow before me. And I'm not saying this in pride. I'm saying this because God showed me they didn't believe it. That's fine. God had to test Joseph on his journey of faith to show not just Joseph but the world that this faith can be substantiated under an old covenant. And so Joseph is journeying one day. His brothers, you know, they rush him. They throw him into, an, into, a, into a dry well. And from the dry well, they sell him to slavers. And from slavers, he goes to Potiphar's house. And from Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife tries to set him up. After that set up, he goes to prison. From prison, he becomes a, a, he becomes a, not a, he becomes a, a, a glorified prisoner. because He becomes a chief of prisoners because of the favor that is upon his life. But even even then, there are people that are promising they will get him out because of his gifting. They've utilized his gifting to get out of prison whilst he's still in prison. Until one day, somebody say one day. In the fullness of time. Somebody say in the fullness of time. Whilst his faith was tried and tested, he stood at the final stage of his ascension journey. He stood in front of Pharaoh and he gave the definition or the description to Pharaoh's uh, uh, dreams and visions. And from that point, the Lord opened the gates and said, here is the reality of the faith that I deposited in you when you were a young man. There was a faith that was deposited that after it was tried and it was tested. Somebody say tried and it was tested. How do you want to separate yourself from other people in the journey? I spoke about last week. The unbelievers, they are wealthy. They are successful. They are popular. They are this, they are that. And they don't operate under God's realm of faith. What is the difference between you and that person? You've got to have something of substance. 
When we were singing before we started, let the weight of your glory cover us. They've got to, there's got to be a difference between you and every other average Joe you see on the street. What's the differentiating marker? It's got to be your faith. That when you were tried and you were tested, you came out stronger. That when you were, that when you were burnt and when you, went, when you went through the furnaces of God, you came out as refined gold. You didn't come like gold that lo it looks like in, in an underground cave or tunnel. You came out looking like a, like a refined piece of gold that can be sold for a, an incredible amount of money because you carry substance. Many of us don't want to journey in the area of faith because we want something that's cheap. You go to a second-hand store and you give them something cheap, they're going to give you something worth the value of that which you give them. You want to stand before a world that is fickle, that is fake, that is passing away. Jesus even said that this world is perverse. and You want to offer them something cheap. Jesus, his first miracle. Remember this. Jesus' his first miracle. When he, when he turned the water to wine. You know what the MC of the wedding said? He said that they saved the best wine till last. Normally, they serve the good wine first. In the culture of the day, normally, they serve the good wine first. And then after, they sell you the the wine that they sell on uni campuses, that, that caliber of wine, that's what, they, that's what they were selling. That's what they gave to them. They didn't even sell it to them. They gave it to them for free. But the MC said, you saved the best to last. It's not even like Jesus. And you know the thing? Jesus, is, Jesus was, wasn't, he wasn't even trying to be bait. He wasn't trying to be open. He wasn't trying to, to let the world know that, ha, ah, my ministry has arrived. I'm here now. Because even when his mother was telling him X, Y, and Z, he was like, look, my time has not yet come, woman. It's not, it's not now. So the point I'm trying to get at is that your, the, 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 your faith must be substantiated. And your faith is substantiated when it's tried and it's tested. Some of you, Lord, why am I going through this thing? Why am I, why am I going through, why am I going through this level of suffering? Your faith is being substantiated. Paul, the Bible says he was afflicted with a thorn in his flesh. Doesn't matter what the thorn in his flesh was. What we know, God said, is my grace is sufficient for you. Some of Paul's greatest writings came from his affliction. What's the best that your faith has to offer to this generation? Is it money? Is it God blessed me and gave me a new job? There's people have that have better jobs than you. God blessed me with good salary. There's people that have better salary than you. God gave me a nice house. There's people that have nicer houses than you. So what's the difference between your faith and what the world has? Your faith, when it's substantiated, it offers value to a fallen world. So it's based on the substructure. And Jesus is our substructure. Amen? Upon which we build our hope from. So now we're going to quickly, quickly, quickly fly. We're going to quickly fly. Let's go to the same chapter. And we're going to go to verse 23. Hebrews 11 verse 23, it says, It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. Have any of you seen, have any of you carried something or God has shown you something or, or you just have a sense that the hand of God is upon something but you're not sure which, which area it is. There's, there's a purpose on this thing but I can't quite see. 
I've got this idea, but I don't know where exactly I'm going to start. But I just know that this idea is something that God wants me to execute. How many of you have, have been in a space like that? So now imagine, imagine um, Jochebed, who was Moses' mom. She was carrying something for nine to ten months. Context of the time was that Pharaoh had offered an edict to say, all boys... All young boys, two, three and below, ought to be executed. And the context for that was because the, in, in Exodus 1, it said that even though the children of Israel were in slavery in Egypt, in a foreign land, it said that they were waxing stronger and stronger. This, guys, when we talk about faith being substantiated, this, this is what it looks like. How can people who are slaves... In a foreign land. They're not even in their own land. They're in a foreign land. But they are waxing stronger. They are building capacity. They are arising in the midst of being slaves. And so the Pharaoh was able to sniff something. You know what? You know what? I, I would even say that, that Pharaoh had some, some spiritual insight. Maybe from, maybe from some of the soothsayers or some of the witch doctors that were around him to say, look, there's, there's, there's a rebellion on the way. There's an uprising on the way. There's a deliverer that's on the way. We can't snuff it out. But what we can tell you is that it's in this age, age range. So what you've got to do is you've got to neutralize this demographic this age group, and when you do so, you will remove their deliverer. The enemy's cunning. He did the same thing for Jesus Christ. Same strategy. The wise men from the east, they came. They made the mistake of, of passing through Herod's house. We've come to see the king. Uh, which king? <laughs> You, you haven't come to see, no, we've come, no, there's a king, the, 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 there's a king, <laughs> but it's not you. So, so, what, where, what, how? And mind you, these, these wise men that were coming, they were not believers as well, they were unbelievers. So even them, it, they had a level of insight from what they could read and maybe some spiritual insight to a degree. But Herod tapped into that and said, you know what? I also must have to neutralize a particular demographic of this age range to ensure that the uprising that should come from Israel won't happen. So we go back to Exodus. It says, Jochebed, knowing, not fully knowing the purposes of God, but knowing that something that she carried had the ability to cause the deliverance that her people needed, kept the baby. I've come to submit to you today that even in the midst of a cost of living crisis, an impending recession, darkness all over the globe, I've come to challenge you today and say that that which the Lord has put in your hands, in your spiritual wombs, in, 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 your, in your vicinity to look after and guard, please guard it cautiously. Don't throw it away. The enemy wants you to throw it away. You know what? You don't have X and you don't have Y and you don't have Z and you, you don't have the knowledge. You don't have the, 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 the skill set. You don't have the, the, the capacity. You don't have the, the, the know-how or the people. You don't know the people. But God is saying, I didn't ask you for all that. Keep what I've given to you. If you keep the seed, as Paul says, we read earlier, 2 Corinthians 9, he gives seed to the sower. God gave the seed to Jochebed and her husband to carry. She didn't know the full extent of it. But she knew that this boy cannot be, this boy cannot come and die. I didn't, I'm not carrying this baby for him to come and die. Somehow he's got to live. 
And so today I want to prophesy to the dry bones in your life. I want to prophesy to those unborn things in your life that the Lord which, uh, wishes sorry, to bring to life. I pray that the Lord would give you the boldness to hold on to that thing. That you would stand even when the enemy has sent out edicts in the spirit. Or even maybe the government has sent out word that this has to be cancelled or you can't do this or you can't do that. But the Lord would give you an, an audacity and an audaciousness to hold on to that thing in the midst of that because that which you carry is to bring deliverance Jochebed is carrying a baby they def they're defiling the king's orders, the, the, the king wants these boys dead but they're hiding it so now the enemy in, in this day and age, the enemy is, is, he's not necessarily just always sending people. Sometimes he's sending intrusive thoughts. Thoughts that will come into your mind to sabotage the will of God. He's sending thoughts in the name of fear. To come and destroy those imaginations. Remember I said fear presents its own realities. And part of those realities are to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And so sometimes in your God-redeemed uh, imagination, fear seeps in. This is so big. This is, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I, I just, but, but what about this? But the, the whataboutism, they call it. It seeps in and begins to, to, to snip at, at the plans and the destiny that God has for you. In that he's been that he's been pushing you into in your imagination. And so the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 10, verse 5, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture the yes, we capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Lord, how can I grow in my faith? We capture those vain imaginations. I love, the, I love this translation. It says, we captured those rebellious thoughts, which means that, that the writer of this knew that there's, there's an order to this thing. In God's order of imagination, it's always optimism. It's always, we're going to have, there's always going to be a healthy harvest. There's always going to be fruitfulness. There's always going to be multiplication. But when the enemy comes in, you know how it's the enemy because the thoughts are rebellious. They are anti-God. Everything God has said to you or, or shown you, everything the enemy comes to bring is anti what God has shown you. If God has shown you deliverance, you know what the enemy is going to show you? Show you that you're bound. Even though that you're even though you're not bound, the enemy is going to show you you are bound. But what about last week? But what about last year? But what about this? But what about that? What about what you used to do? The enemy is always going to bring something contrary to the will of God. But the Bible says we must capture those thoughts. That's why we've got to be a spiritual people. Can't just be praying and praying and praying and not be aware of what the, when the enemy is trying to come in and show you something contrary to the will of God or speak something contrary to the will of God or act out or play out something in your mind that's contrary to the will of God. You've got to capture it. Turn to your neighbor and say, capture it. You've got to be aggressive about this thing. You've got to be violent about this thing. When it comes to the area of faith, you've got to be on guard. You've got to be on watch. Because the enemy wants you to be complacent. Oh, well, God showed it to me, but it's just not my time. The only reason you're saying it's not your time because the enemy showed you something contrary and you're not ready to warfare for what God has shown you. That's, let, let, let's be very honest, guys. Let's be very honest. There's a very spiritually lazy generation. And I'm not talking about the realms of works. But I'm talking about being able to be discerning about God's movement in your life. And notice the enemy's, the enemy's opposition to what God is doing in your life. The enemy comes. You're just, you're crying. Oh, oh, I had a bad dream last night. Is that it? Oh, the enemy, the enemy is after my finances, X, Y, and Z. But you're still alive, no? 
Why is everyone looking at me strange? The enemy's trying to steal, you know, my finances. I got five parking tickets. Well, next time, find a good parking space first. And then on top of that, okay, that's fine. It's cool. Let's look at ways we can address it. As long as you're still alive, there is hope. And as long as you are aware, let us be on the front foot. These people who were under a lesser covenant, it's like they believed more. Because they saw something that was intangible. They saw, some, they saw something that was intangibly tangible. What do I mean? They had a glimpse of Christ. They had a glimpse of God moving in their life. And Abraham, for example, an old man, gone past the age of good fertility. Sarah, an old woman, gone past the age of good fertility. And yet God came to them and said, you will have a son and because of you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. There's something that there was a God level audacity. There was a God level of audacity. If there's anything I want to challenge you guys with, it's a God level audacity. We can't just come to church, pray, sing songs, and just be, look, yeah, life is tough and life is this. We need to be a people that believe. I know we have seen madness. I know we see crazy things in the world around us. But can we be a people that just believe? God said it. I, I've got an illness in my body. I've been praying for the last two years. Nothing has happened. In fact, sometimes when I pray, it feels like it gets worse. But you know what, brother, sister? I'm calling on you to believe again. I'm calling on you to have faith in God again. Because in your faith, God is making that which is intangible, the tangible things that we are going to see at one point. God is raising a generation who will believe for the impossible not because they want to show off to the world and not because they're looking for a name but because they wi they're, they're, they're willing to put their lives on the line to show that God truly is the one that is establishing this thing called faith we take every thought captive some of you say how can I grow in my faith that's one point. Take captive of the thoughts that are eating and jumping at your faith. It says by faith, Moses refused to identify with Pharaoh's house. Some of you, and I, and I prayed it earlier, some of you, even though you're believers, you are choosing to identify with things that God has not called you to identify with. You know what? This is my class. This is, this is my social ranking. This is my social status. I don't know. Poverty is just, it's just a thing in my family. We're, we're, we're just sick all the time. This cancer thing has just ravaged through my family. It's just a thing that we have. You're identifying with things that God wishes you not to identify with. And so Moses, the Bible says that Moses was raised in the house of Pharaoh. How many of you know that? Moses, how many of you know? Or do we need to do a Bible study on Exodus? Moses was raised after his parents kept him and they, you know, they put him in a reed basket and they put him down the Nile. And the Bible says that Pharaoh's daughter was able to take him in and his sister and his mom, you know, came as, you know, midwives. And somehow through the Lord's favor, they were able to be midwives to, to Moses. So Moses was reared in the house of Pharaoh. But as Moses was growing up, the Bible says that Mo there was something in Moses' heart that didn't want him to identify with the house of Pharaoh. Moses would go out and he would see the children of Israel suffering and there was a small voice saying, those are your people. You're walking and you're seeing slaves battered and bruised. Whip lashes, whip lash marks on their back. Muddy and, 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 and they, 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 they just poor, broken, bruised people. 
And something said in Moses' heart, these are my people. Imagine someone who's been raised in affluence, the highest house of, of, of the land, and yet he's choosing to identify with the lowly people. This is what faith does. Faith, it, it doesn't make sense. Do you think, faith, do you think Moses knew that, ah, you know what, maybe I'm their deliverer. Maybe I'm the one. No, 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 no. It just said, Moses chose not to identify with the house of Pharaoh. He had enough faith to believe that, look, these are not my people. They might paint my face. They might, they might dress me up like an, an Egyptian, but I'm not really one. It, it, it takes faith to, to not identify with the position that you are now. It, it takes faith to not identify with the chapter of life that you are in now. Oh, so some of you, yeah, yeah, this, this, yeah, yeah. This side, you're, you're, you're way too. It takes faith to not identify with the chapter of life you are in now. Some of you are judging your whole life by the chapter of the book of life that you are in right now. Not knowing it's only a chapter. And God has, that, uh, every book is a journey. One chapter is just the phase. So God is calling his people to not judge themselves by where they are at now, by, but by what the end of the book describes. Did you hear what I said? You cannot judge yourself by the chapter of book you are in but rather by what the end of the book says. In the beginning of the scripture, it says how God made man and woman, they fell. That was the beginning of, of the biblical context. But by the end of it, it talks about a new heaven and a new earth. It talks about beautiful, supernatural bodies. It talks about every nation, every kindred, every tribe, every tongue. We can't judge ourselves by what happened at Genesis. Our focus has to be about what the end of the book says. So let's stand. just going to read this scripture over every one of us. Every eye closed. Lay your hand on your heart. The next chapter is Hebrews 12. And Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says this. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great, huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. How do we do this? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross disregarding the shame now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne today Lord Jesus teach every person here to gaze upon you to look to you I don't say this in a poetic way I say this in a, in a very serious way we look to Jesus when we are facing our trials, when we are facing our storms, we look to Jesus. Jesus is the initiator and the perfecter of our faith. Whatever your issue in the area of faith is, I pray today that your first, your heart's desire would be to run to Jesus. For he will establish and perfect your faith. Let this be a house 
that walks in the grace of faith. To not just believe for our own personal selves, but to believe for those around us, to believe for our communities, to believe for our cities, to believe for our nation. Don't just let faith rise in this place today, Lord, but let faith be our life. Let, let faith be our life. Not just a moment, but let faith be the life from which we govern all our decisions, how we talk, how we behave, how we respond. Let faith be our way of life. take every thought that doesn't align with the will and the purposes of God we take them captive we are aware of you fear we know who you are so every form of fear in anybody that is standing in this place today we command you to leave in the name of Jesus Christ doubt we command you to leave every heart thank you Jesus in Jesus name we have prayed amen amen let's take our seats so we have uh, Tuesday prayers 6am make sure you log in and be a part of it um, this week as well, it's mainly uh, something that the Lord has laid on my heart as a personal thing. But I want to just encourage, I want, I want to set everyone a challenge. This week is the last week of June. It's the last week of June and I want everyone to commit one day to pray, to fast. Somebody say Fast. And to pray. July is our birthday month by the grace of God. And I want us to just commit one day of this week. If you feel like it's more, that's up to you. I know what the Lord has said to me. Mine is different to, to you guys. But one day, I want you to commit to fast and pray for city, for city worship. Huh? Okay, okay. I want us to fast and, and, and to pray. Is that okay? So that's Tuesday prayer, morning prayer. Choose one day of the week to pray for city worship as well. And once again, I want us to encourage um, those that are not here, send them a message, check in on them, see how they're doing. But two, the work of an evangelist. Prof said something this week about the, uh, the city worship night in two weeks that we should at least endeavor to invite five people but that's for city worship night I want us to endeavor to do that for Sundays how about we do that for Sundays yes if we all invited five people on a Sunday we wouldn't be here next month it's just a practical fact if every one of us here invited five people, we would not be here next month. <laughs> we would have to leave this place <laughs> on a practical note. Yes? So it's just a practical thing. And it is possible. It's possible on a few things, but I'm not here to preach today anyway. The time is wrapping up and I'm getting to preacher mode again. But yeah, I'm going to give it to, to Dr. Nikki. Um, but finally, I do want to say in terms of... You can come. I do want to say in terms of the ninth, please, guys... We still need, we still need um, financial contributions towards the day. There's still quite a bit to get um, in terms of equipment for the day. Um, we're trusting in God. It's interesting that this month has been about faith. We are really trusting in the Lord to provide for us. We've got two weeks. We've literally got two weeks. Two weeks on this exact day, we've got city worship night. And I believe, I don't know about you guys, but I'm choosing to believe that the Lord would meet all our needs, that we would not be in debt, that we would not be in lack. Wow, the amens are low. 
I don't know. Can we, in fact, everybody stand up and say amen? Because this laid back. If I said, if I said that God would bless you, you would shout the loudest amen. Amen, literally. It's a, it's a word of agreement. I'm not believing by myself. This is, I, this is, see, I am not city worship. We are city worship. So we have to have this collective mentality. I can't be praying and you guys, amen. Because at the end of the day, it's all on us. Am I lying, prof? It's all on us. Two weeks on, so everyone will come. They will not say, oh, it's got to do with AP, prof, and PT. They'll be looking at every one of us. So if we believe that it is possible, we don't just say amen, but we trust the Lord. How can we meet this need? Amen? Amen. Fantastic.